today we have with us Mr. Vishnu Mohan, Assistant Professor of Department of Electronics and Instrumentation, College of Engineering, Vadagara. Mr. Vishnu has completed his B.Tech, securing first rank in 2009 from Pusat and did M.Tech in the same university in 2014. He has over 10 years of teaching experience and is a member of various organizations such as the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, Society for Technical Education and the Instrument Society of India. Attendees, please note that you can post your questions and doubts in the Q&A box available in your screen. Your queries will be addressed by the faculty in due course. Sir, it is with great pleasure that I welcome you to the session. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for this nice introduction. Uh, I want to note one more point that uh, my college, uh, my institution, College of Engineering, Vadagara, which is established as the very first institution uh, in Kerala under the CAPE, the Cooperative Academy for Professional Education, uh, uh, under established under the uh, Ministry of Cooperation, Government of Kerala. So uh, with this, uh, we can start the session. So this uh, session is uh, uh, basically the uh, last module, that is the sixth module of uh, A204 sensors and transducers, that is a flow measurement, uh, which is, uh, the university prescribed uh, almost eight hours course, but uh, unfortunately, uh, because of the situation, we are limiting our discussion to one hour. So, uh, uh, without losing the essence of the uh, things, uh, I'm delivering you within one hour. I'm trying to deliver to you in, in one hour. So, the discussion is flow measurement. So, these are the uh, arrangement of topics which we'll cover in the course. Uh, so, why we need a flow measurement? What is need of uh, Measure, uh, measuring flow. So mainly there are two situations where we need uh, measurement. Primary without proportion of materials introduced to a process. So uh, let's consider the, uh, the Haber process where one molecule of nitrogen gas which combines with molecules of hydrogen gas under some conditions to form two molecules of ammonia. So, uh, uh, when we add nitrogen and uh, hydrogen in 1 to 3 combination, it will form ammonia. So, the proportion of materials, the proportion of these two gases introduced into the reaction chamber uh, is very important. Also, we have to remove the product. So, two molecules of ammonia are removed. So, the second is uh, the, the, to find out the amount of materials evolved by the process. So the primary application where we need flow measure. And secondarily, uh, as we know, uh, most of the high process uh, may have a uh, water connection. So in some other countries, in some other part, parts of the world, they have a cooking gas connection, steam connection, all things are there. So, in order to find out the consumption of this green flow machine, so these are the two points, two situations where uh, flow measurement is very important. So, let's have some history of measurement of flow. It is one. It is considered to be one of the most uh, oldest art in the field of instrumentation. We have ev evidences that Romans used. This high uh, flow measurement in their hydraulics and public engineering works. And many scientific names were, um, uh, scientific names are associated with hydraulics and uh, pneumatic uh, fluid mechanics, which leads to flow measurement. And some of them are Archimedes, Torres Eliot, Oeder, Bernoulli, Reynolds, much more in the list. So let's uh, have some introduction of flow measurement. So flow measurement is actually finding out the flow, flow rate of either solids, liquids, or gases. 
this gases and liquids are collectively termed as fluids so uh, liquid occupy same volume at different pressures and that is why liquids are collectively known as uh, liquids are otherwise called compressible fluids whereas gases occupy different volumes at different pressures and are termed as compressible fluids so there are two ways of measurement of flow one find out the volume how much volume is is usually expressed in meter per meter cube per hour or liter per minute that is lpm liter per hour that is lph in some other situations like we all have uh, uh, during our last two flex seasons the water flow out uh, amount of water flowing out of uh, idukki dam that is ex that, that is expressed in gallons when we are expressing the huge units we we'll say the, uh, uh, the unit used is gallons per hour then the thing is to find out the mass flow the mass flow rate which is usually expressed in tons per hour or kilogram per minute and so on. so basically flow is of two types one is the laminar flow and another is the turbulent flow which you can uh, see in the figure to so compare the laminar flow to a situation uh, students are coming to a assembly, school assembly in a uh, in five nine so all are uh, coming in a line that means there is a, 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 a what you call order is there so it is strictly highly ordered all the uh, layers are in parallel whereas um, the turbulent flow situation can be compared to uh, people who are going for a, a first first day first show movie so so a movie and they and they are in a highly disordered state so in turbulence the fluid turns chaotic so there are in turbulence we have rapid fluctuations laminar flow is usually having low velocity uh, laminar profile is like a parabola that is the air is at the center of the pipe is in the highest value when we are moving towards the inner surface the friction forces increases and hence the velocity decreases which will give us a parabolic profile where in turbulence we have a logarithmic profile so something like the same velocity for a particular layer almost now we will distinguish this laminar uh, or turbulence by a number called reynolds number i'll i'll tell you in the next slide reynolds if the number less than 2200 to the lamina whereas if the flow is great i mean uh, when the number is greater than 4000 flow is uh, considered to be turbulent reynolds number is a ratio is a ratio of two forces that is the inertial force to viscous force since it is a ratio of two forces it is a dimensionless yeah. parameter uh, you can see the inertial force in the numerator so as the numerator increases reynolds number increases and hence it promotes turbulent flow and the viscous force is in the denominator so as the denominator increases the number decreases and hence increasing viscous force promotes laminar flow so this is the equation for finding out the uh, reynolds number r is equal to rho vd divided by mu Air. rho is the density of the fluid v is its velocity d is the diameter of the pipe and mu is the viscosity so as re increases there is a risk of turbulence there is a risk of turbulence so if uh, for a particular and a, for a particular pipe density 
viscosity and diameter is constant. We can say that as velocity increases, as strength increases. Now we move to the classification of flow meters. Flow meters are classified mainly depending upon the physical principle involved in its operation. Uh, there are many uh, flow meters available. We are limiting our discussion to four different types. First one is the variable flow meter, which is otherwise called a differential pressure flow meter. The second one is digital area, and the other ones are mechanical and so we can see one by one. So first one is variable variable head flow meter. Which is based on the Bernoulli's theorem. Bernoulli's theorem states that in a fluid stream, the sum of pressure, velocity, and elevation heads at a point is equal to their sum at any other point in the direction of from the first point plus the losses to friction between these two points. So this is the Bernoulli's theorem. So we can consider a, a fluid uh, which is having density flow flowing through pipe of variable cross sectional area. So the pipe is get different levels from a reference point x reference line xy. So we consider uh, a small volume B C B C B D E C uh, which is having a volume uh, of V. The mean area of cross section is A1 and the thickness is Ds. So when this volume is up, the area of cross section decreases. So, so in order to maintain the fixed volume, the, the thickness increases. So the mean area of cross section reduced to A2, an increase in thickness of Ds2. So Ds2 is the uh, final uh, thickness. So we are pushing this uh, volume element with a force F1 and there experiences another backward force F2. So this is the situation and uh, this fluid is uh, assumed to flow with a mean velocity V1 at section 1 and V2 at section 2. Now, now we uh, work this volume of fluid. The work done is the uh, difference in two works at two locations. Uh, the, volume, the, the volume element is flowing in upward direction. Uh, the force at section 1 is considered as force. So the equation is W, the work done W is equal to F1 ds Nothing but pushing to displacement minus F2 ds So this F1 can be written as can be rewritten as pressure into area. So if P1 is the pressure at location 1 and P2 is the pressure at section 2, we can rewrite the equation as P1 A1 ds1 minus P2 A2 ds2. As we know, area into thickness is the volume. So A1 ds1 is the volume element at first look. A2 ds2 is the volume element at the second location. So we can read that V1 V2 V2. We know this one V1 and V2. The, the volume elements are same. So we can replace it with single value V. So the final equation will become W is equal to V1 plus V2 into V. So next we will uh, look at the kinetic energy. Change in kinetic energy is nothing but energy at the second point minus kinetic energy point that is half m v2 square minus half m v1 square where m represents the mass of the volume element that is nothing but its density into volume. Then the potential energy so the second volume element is uh, uh, the density of the second volume element is uh, height h2 and uh, that of the first volume element is at the height so the potential energy change can be written as mg h2 minus g h1 
where uh, m is mass of the volume element and g represents the acceleration due to gravity. So these are the three equations we have. You can go the uh, energy theorem. Work done is the change in energy. So one side we have work and the other side we have the change in energy. So when we are rearranging that uh, terms corresponds to section one is at one side of the equation and section two at the other side of the equation you will get p1 p plus half mv1 square plus mgh1 equal to p2 plus half mv2 square plus mgh2. Now we can remember this throughout volume v. So the equation will become p1 plus half m by v. Mass by volume is nothing but the density. So half rho v1 square m by v is again rho, so half uh, uh, rho g h1 and similarly the other side p2 plus half rho v2 square plus rho g h2. So this is the equation. Uh, when we are dividing this equation throughout with uh, rho that is a specific rate which is nothing but I mean gamma which is equal to rho into g now it, it, it is nothing but the specific weight. So when we are dividing this, you get P1 by gamma plus uh, the rho will get cancelled and you will get V1 square divided by 2G plus H1 is equal to P2 by gamma plus V2 square by 2G H2. Here the P1 by gamma is the term pressure head. Then the next is the velocity head. And finally, the elevation. So this is the uh, derivation of a Bernoulli scale. That is the pressure head, velocity, and elevation head at section one is equal to the sum at section two. Here, the point which lacks is the friction. So we assume that this is a frictionless setup. So uh, that is how we can derive. Uh, a frictionless uh, Bernoulli's equation for a frictionless incompressible fluid. Now, if the flow is continuous, continuity equation can be applied, and this is the continuity equation that is, the area into velocity at any point is equal to a constant, that is, area into velocity equal to at one point equal to area into velocity at some point. This you may experience with the uh, garden hose. When we are writing the area of a garden hose, uh, the velocity increases and the liquid will, water will flow uh, with high velocity. So that is the continuity equation. And QE is nothing but the volume that well, velocity into area. Area is usually expressed in meter square. Velocity is in meter per second. So you will get meter cube per second, which is nothing but the volume flow rate. So uh, V1 can be written as A2 by A1 into V2. If D1 and D2 are the diameters of uh, the two sections, we can uh, say A1 by A2 by A1 is D2 square divided by pi by 4 D1 square or D2 by D1 the whole square. Here D2 is the restricted area and D1 is the original area. So D2 by D1 is uh, termed as beta. So the entire thing A2 by A1 will become beta square. So B1 will become beta square D2. That's this equation. So we have the uh, equation we derived from the Bernoulli's theorem P1 by gamma plus all the heads at one point equal to all the heads at the other point. When we are changing this, to make v2 square by v1 square, both of the terms is having a denominator 2g. Uh, when it goes to the other side, uh, it will come in the numerator. So p2 by gamma minus p1 by gamma plus h2 minus h1. So when we are replacing v1 square with beta square v, the equation will become v2 square into 1 minus beta raised to 4 equal to the other, other, other side of the equation. So that is this equation. Uh, 
when you are finding out an equation for d2 uh, it will become 1 by root of 1 minus beta raised to 4 root of the entire thing so qv is equal to a2 into v2 we have uh, uh, arrived at v2 so when you are multiplying this with area you will get the flow rate metric flow rate so this is the volumetric flow rate where this 1 by root of 1 minus beta raised to 4 is termed as the velocity approach factor E. Now, so far we have not considered the friction and contraction. About contraction, I will tell you uh, something later. Uh, but here, so far we have uh, not considered the friction and contraction. So this can be uh, included can be compensated with a coefficient called discharge coefficient c so when you are uh, the, the first equation which we see is a theoretical one but for practical approaches, approaches we have to have a coefficient called discharge coefficient so when we are uh, including the, that coefficient to the equation you will get the final equation qv equal to c a e into root of uh, all the other things. So the C is the discharge coefficient, E is the approach factor, and A2 is the uh, restricted area. So this is the equation. Okay, so if we kept uh, these two points, two sections at same elevation, the difference H2 minus H1 is will become zero. So we can neglect that part. We can uh, remove that part. So the equation will become Q V equal to C A to B root of 2G by gamma P2 minus P1. That means uh, the all the other parameters except P2 is constant. That is Q V can be uh, uh, Q V can be considered as uh, proportional to the square root of the difference. Now this is the theory behind variable head flow meter. Then we move to the uh, flow meter which we use practical equation. The first one is an orifice plate. This is the figure. Uh, it is a, a simple a plate of metal with a circular opening. Uh, depending upon the position and shape of this opening, uh, we can have three different configurations. First one is the concentric. Why I have put it in red is uh, our, our area of discussion is limited to concentric. So, eccentric that is the opening is more close to the bottom side of the pipe. In the previous side, we, you can see this is the orifice plate. We have a hole inside and we have a tongue. This tongue is for identifying the position of the hole uh, if it is eccentric. So this is eccentric. We have a solid segment and an open part. Then this is segmented. These are the three different uh, combinations. Yeah. Segmented means uh, it is a semicircular shape and it is more close to towards the uh, bottom side of the pipe. This eccentric and segmented uh, orifice plates are used for situations where the fluid is having some, some suspended particles, uh, some colloidal particles. Uh, as the flow velocity increases, flow velocity increases means the velocity head increases. Uh, we are keeping the ele elevation head constant. So, in order to maintain, in order to stick on to the Bernoulli's principle, the pressure has to come down. Now, this is so. This is the orifice plate. You can see this is the orifice plate. So, the pressure profile we are. Uh, we, we have actually 12 different uh, points where we will sense pressure. So this is the first uh, section. Uh, that is the it approaches the orifice. So uh, up to two, there is a constant pressure. That is the pressure of the fluid. Then uh, further it proceeds. Three, two, three, and four. There is a slight increase in pressure. That means the volume is I mean, uh, velocity is slightly reduced. So that is why there is a slight increase in pressure. And at the orifice, 
what happens is the jet the is at high velocity so at high velocity means the pressure the pressure drops and it reaches minima which is known as the vena contracta vena contracta is the point where the flow experience the minimum pressure so i already have uh, told you about contraction uh, this is the place where i explain contraction when or this fluid leaves the orifice it is having some inertia and for some point it experiences uh, that that contraction that uh, what do you call the decrease in area so the area still vena contracta since the area is uh, minimum at vena contracta the velocity is maximum and hence the pressure is so from the vena contracta it starts its recovery pressure recovery so the pressure recovers in position but you can see there is a net pressure loss the upstream and downstream pressures are different that there exists some pressure loss so this is the commonly used uh, pressure tappings we have a pipe tap and flange uh, flange tap uh, flange is nothing but the thing which so pipe tap pipe tap uh, we usually take uh, the upstream tapping at a distance of d d is nothing but the pipe tap uh, from the orifice and downstream d by 2 so this is the commonly used uh, setup uh, but in some cases it may uh, uh, adversely affect the discharge coefficient the discharge coefficient may vary in some in those situations we will switch to the corner tap where we'll uh, hold make a hole at the flange uh, which is at um, some degrees which is less than 45 degree and we will take uh, pressure from the two side of the orifice that is one thing but some situations it is not uh, highly recommended to hold the pipe drill the pipe or the flange in that cases uh, holes will um, come with the assembly uh, that is called the flange tap so it is uh, actually integrated with the flange we need uh, need not uh, make any holes in this situation we have two different configurations here so that is all about the pressure tapping then we can see some uh, thing about the construction of uh, orifice plate Uh, usually we use a stainless steel ss or gun metal or phosphor bronze for uh, manufacturing of this plate which uh, may vary depending upon the application uh, and thickness of the orifice plate is very important uh, usually 1.5 mm thickness is quite uh, less than 15 cm that is 6 inch uh, diameter and more than uh, if the pipe dial is more than 6 inch we will go for uh, 3 mm then edges you edge upstream edges are uh, made flat whereas the downstream edges when the downstream edges are flat what what happens uh, when the fluid leaves the orifice if there is any suspended particles it will Uh, make some um, tear or tear whatever at the uh, at that part at, at that line. So that is why the downstream keep it. Then we will put some break holes. That is, if we are using liquids, there may be some uh, the, some diffuse gases in it. So in order uh, to provide a path for the gas, we we'll, uh, put a break hole. Out. top of the um, top side of the pipe and for gas we uh, may have some uh, suspended uh, water molecules or gas uh, liquids so we we'll, uh, put put a hole at the bottom side so the merits and demerits of the orifice plate it is very simple in construction you can see it's a simple plate with a, a circular hole uh, and its reliability is high 
uh, when we are talking about the demerits, this happens. So we have to uh, do some compensation for that to use. So additional compensating compensations uh, needed. Uh, this wear and tear causes uh, calibration changes. So that is one of the disadvantages. High pressure loss is there. Upstream pressure and uh, downstream pressure are different. There is high pressure loss. Uh, this uh, is due to the upward change in area. So the change in area is sudden. And it is not used with uh, very high fluid densities. Uh, and so also uh, some particles may block tapping, the upstream and downstream tapping, which used for uh, finding out the P2 pressures. This block tapping may, uh, may demand frequent maintenance. So this abrupt change in area is the main difficulty of using uh, orifice plate, which, which uh, leads to the high pressure loss. So, do you have any other advice with uh, change in area, gradual change in area that will be better, and that is the flow nozzle. So, in flow nozzle, we have gradual increase area of cross section. You can see the area of is decreasing, and this segment uh, can be considered as a one fourth part of an ellipse. So we have different flow nozzles with uh, different eccentricity of the area. So this is one of the things. Now, now the flow nozzle is actually similar to orifice in simplicity, but uh, differ in down. So the fresh, um, pressure loss, pressure loss is comparatively less uh, in uh, flow nozzle when we are comparing that with orifice. Uh, this curved form of approach uh, colloids to pass through. The performance is uh, better at high velocities, but the difficulty is uh, here we lack an expansion core. So downstream we doesn't have we don't have any expansion core. So that is one of the flow uh, difficulty of flow nozzle, and this leads to the evolution of venturi tube. Uh, it is uh, usually made by uh, uh, same materials as we have seen in uh, orifice plate, uh, metal, steel, steel, cast iron, all these things are used for uh, manufacturing this tube. Mainly there are three sections. One is the converging cone, which is the decrease in area of cross section. Then there is a throat, cylindrical throat, where we have a constant area of cross section. And there is a diverging recovery cone. The recovery cone is actually meant for the pressure recovery. So that is in order to minimize, in order to nullify the pressure drop across the device. So the tapping points are marked here, the upstream tap and downstream tap. Upstream tap is at the uh, starting point of the uh, converging cone and the downstream is at the, at the throat. So we can, you, you can see some uh, holds but annular chambers that is uh, around the circumference we have uh, some holes these holes are uh, meant to average the pressure have pressure at that particular point with transmission to the measurement system so uh, it is noted that the discharge coefficient is all, almost about 0.99 that is it is approximately equal to 1 that means the friction and contraction effects are minimum in this venture. And the discharge coefficient is constant for beta. Uh, beta is nothing but the diameter ratio for 0.25 to 0.75. That is the diameter of the pipe and ratio of the diameter of uh, the restriction and the diameter of the pipe. The cross section need not be circular. You can have a, a rectangular cross section or you can have a square cross section. So the cross section need not be a, a factor in uh, venture tube. Uh, it is tend to abrasion. Uh, demerits are large dimension is uh, not feasible. 
why because the cost will become high for uh, for the manufacturing of this device and its use when orifice plate cannot be used so if we can have orifice plate for this particular application we will go for orifice plate if orifice plate cannot be used for the application then we will go for the other two that is the uh, flow nozzle and the venturi tube so this is an evolution from orifice to flow nozzle to venturi tube next we will see the variable area flow meter now we have equation which we have derived in case of uh, variable head flow meter that is flow rate is equal to c discharge coefficient a area of cross section e velocity approach factor into root g by pressure difference. now if you are keeping the pressure difference constant what will happen g is a constant gamma is constant e is constant and c is constant the only thing which we can vary is a2 so if you are keeping the pressure difference constant the the flow rate will become uh, proportional to in fact proportional to that is area of flow that is why the name variable area from otherwise called variable aperture meter or constant pressure drop meter or rotameter rotameter is just a brand name for this uh it actually having two sections one is the vertical tube which is a tapered cone which is made up of either glass stainless steel or metal uh this material is varied depending upon the application depending upon the nature of the fluid uh, used there is the which is otherwise called bob which is made up of brass or stainless steel some uh, type of plastic so this is a variable area flow meter now we can uh, see the various forces acting on the float when it is inside the uh, uh, conical pipe so one is the gravitational force this down arrow indicates the force is acting downwards so uh, the gravitational force is equal to vf rho f g where vf is the volume of the float rho f density of the float and g acceleration due to gravity that is one force other is the buoyancy buoyant force which is acting upward that is b is equal to vf again volume rho is the density of the fluid g acceleration due to gravity drag force uh, which is the force uh, by the velocity of the fluid flowing up so the drag force is also in upward direction which is proportional to the square of velocity it is half k af rho v square k is a constant that we'll see later af is the area of the float rho uh, v is the velocity of the float rho is the density that we already have seen so these are the three equations so you can see two forces are acting up one force is acting downwards so in order to balance the float at a particular position so that is why w is equal to b plus d i uh, put uh, substitute the values so from this we'll uh, formulate an equation for v square so in order to find out equation for v square uh, uh, vf rho g in the right hand side should go to the left so this will become vf g in rho f minus rho and the thing which we lack is uh, the, the the terms which is with v uh, square so this is 2 by k af rho so this is the equation when you are taking the square root you will get this equation and on uh, taking this k outside come on by root k root of 2g vf by af rho f by rho yes i have just rearranged the equation so here i am uh, substituting root k as cd where cd is the drag coefficient it, it is a coefficient responsible i mean uh, uh, you can see in, in the drag force so that is a drag coefficient so when i am replacing that here you will get 1 by cd root of 2g f by a uh, rho f by rho minus 1 so this is the equation and this is actually an activity for the students uh if the 
flow rate flow rate to be um, independent of the density variations what we will do uh, the partial derivative of qv when we are taking the partial derivative of qv with respect to uh, the density uh, rho and equate that to zero you will get the condition for minimum minimum change of qv and the condition uh, after uh, uh, all the rearrangements you will get rho f is equal to 2 rho that is the density of the float must be twice that of the fluid so if you are using uh, if you are implementing like this the uh, flow rate will be uh, minimally affected by the density variations that you can do on your own so the conclusion of rotameter it is a very ex inexpensive uh, device it is usually uh, used for laboratory testing or in production lines uh, here we have uh, maintained the pressure uh, difference a uh, constant it can be extended up to ranges uh, 6000 liter per minute uh, also we have other configurations which can which we can use for uh, an, a, a, a range expansion uh, if the pipe diameter is very high we can have some bypass lines and uh, this uh, rotameter in it so we can extend the range uh, uh, if you are using it in the main line, the range is up to 6000 LPM. Accuracy is uh, uh, 0.5 to 3 percentage of full scale. And it can also be integrated with alarms, indicators, controllers and reco recorders. Uh, in, in this slide, we can see the, I mean, um, the rotameter. Uh, if a tapered uh, cone, a tapered pipe is not glass, you cannot see the float. In, in uh, that situation, what we use is we have some magnetic linkage arrangement which will uh, exactly determine the position of the float and calculate it accordingly. So, then next is the mechanical flow meter where the flow induces some motion. Uh, this uh, flow rate can be found out by measuring the magnetic motion. Uh, mainly there are two popular combinations one is the positive displacement flow meter and another is the turbine flow meter. so this is the positive displacement flow meter uh, we discuss that uh, discuss the thing about water meters water connection in water connection we actually uh, determine the quantity the amount of liquid uh, coming to our uh, houses we are not measuring the flow rate so positive displacement meters are actually flow quantity meters they are not flow rate meters they will find out the exact quantity of water or liquid from fluid from it can be seen also in uh, petrol pumps uh, or in uh, any other uh, thing where we uh, calculate the consumption the overall consumption so positive displacement uh, flow meter is that category belongs to that category uh, it actually constrains the flow and it prevents leakage from uh, the uh, upstream to downstream it is a self power device uh, we can uh, drive some mechanical counters using this uh, so no condition no is whether the uh, the line is uh, turn and or laminar whatever be the condition uh, uh, there is no importance to the condition many types are there one of the type is the impeller type depending upon the size size shape the working principle the many types are there so we can see impeller type meter we can see uh, uh, two two impellers uh, one assumes uh, a horizontal position whereas another is vertical vertically aligned uh, if the vertically aligned uh, impeller turns by 90 degree it automatically turns the other to vertical so uh, in the first case it is in the form of a t uh, english alphabet t now it is in the form of an inverted t so if uh, when this moves by uh, an angle, amount of uh, fluid is taken 
inlet and pass to the outlet so finding out the rotation revolution of the count i mean impeller you can exactly find out the uh, flow I mean quantity tra transferred from inlet to outlet so that is the uh, impeller flow meter it is having long life uh, frictional losses are less but having uh, some high cost high pressure drop is there so if you have uh, any situations where high pressure loss pressure drop is not acceptable you cannot use this device and it to clean fluids. if the fluid is uh, not clean what happens is it will uh, it will coagulate coagulation uh, meter so that is all about positive displacement flow meter we'll move to the next the turbine flow meter this is the uh, figure which represents the uh, turbine flow meter uh, you can see a turbine uh, which is connected to an uh, then at the rim you can have a uh, can see then uh, at one side of the pipe at the upper side of the pipe you can have a coil uh, which is connected to the data domain so when fluid flows through the pipe it rotates the turbine wheel so at steady state uh, the speed i mean the the angular velocity of rotation is proportional to the flow rate the turbine spin induces potential difference that the turbine spins uh, the magnet uh, the, the, uh, and the magnet arrangement so uh, there is some uh, cut in um, magnetic flux link linkage so it induces some potential difference so we have two uh, different types put one is the frequency and other is the total number of pulses the frequency will give you an insight to the uh, flow rate whereas the number of pulses the total number of pulses will give you the total uh, amount of uh, fluid flow uh, we can linearize output by minimizing the frictional effects by providing uh, frictionless uh, bearings uh, also if upstream is uh, turbulent then you, uh, we may not get the exact result and comes uh, in that situation what we use is some um, flow straighteners which converts this uh, turbulent flow to laminar so that is all about the mechanical flow meters then we will go to the final section that is the uh, electrical flow meter here the electrical energy is required for measurement uh, that, that means this is a passive category of meters uh, there are mainly three kinds of electric flow meters one is the electromagnetic flow meter ultrasonic flow meter and the other is anemometer we'll see one by one electromagnetic flow meter which uh, as in obstruct the flow the basic principle is faraday's laws of electromagnetic induction it is ideally for conductive liquids and conductivity must be in the order of micro siemens per meter this is the figure Uh, we have the equation for induced uh, electricity that is e is equal to b cross v into d where b is the uh, field intensity magnetic field intensity v is the velocity of the uh, rotation of the coil and d is the length of the coil so when we are expanding this you will get b b cross v will become p v theta here you can see This is the electric field, this magnetic field, and this is the flow. So means uh, theta is 90 degree. So uh, sine theta will become one. So electricity uh, induced voltage E is T V P. So uh, Q V the flow rate. this area into velocity you can find velocity from the previous equation that is a is the area e the induced electrical signal d uh, uh, distance that is the uh, diameter of the pipe and b is the field intensity so this is the setup for uh, electromagnetic flow meter
it is very simple in construction no moving parts are there uh, hence we uh, we doesn't experience any hysteresis at losses there uh, it is very insensitive to uh, density temperature and viscosity variations having good accuracy it's a reliable uh, meter and have bidirectional flow that is uh, um, you can measure by flow in any any direction demerits are pipe should be full that means uh, if the if, if any any gap is there we cannot get the exact reading the pipe should be full uh, it is costly for small pipes when you are using small pipes uh, the cost is high now we'll move to ultra ultra excuse me sir meter. yes hello sir okay uh, yeah. so we have reached the final 10 minutes of our session uh, we have some questions can we address that now yeah sure okay uh, sir anushmaya anu has asked what is uh, concentric and eccentric concentric and eccentric concentric means the circular hole is at the center eccentric means the circular hole is at one side of the pipe either at bottom or at top usually at the bottom of the pipe that is the difference between concentric and eccentric okay uh, then uh, miss akshara has asked where is variable head flow meter used in practical applications uh, in practical applications uh, you can use this variable head flow meter for any applications uh, what the difference is uh, if you are using glass the liquid should be clean if the material of the uh, corn if it is glass the liquid should be clean uh, otherwise we can go for other uh, configurations but the application is limited to 6000 liter per minute okay Hello. okay that's all the question there is from the uh, students uh, you can continue sir we have just uh, 10 minutes uh, left we are at ultrasonic flow from there are two methods one is the doppler frequency shift method and another is the transit time method in doppler frequency shift we transmit ultrasonic uh, waves into the flow then uh, some suspended particles may be there which impart some frequency shift uh, uh, frequency shift is uh, proportional to the velocity of flow we will measure the uh, frequency shift with some electronic counters and we will calculate the instrument mainly. That is the Doppler, Doppler frequency shift method. Uh, what uh, other is the transit time? This is a transit time meter. Here we have two pair of transmitters and receivers. Uh, transmitter A, uh, the signal transmitted by A is received by the receiver A. Uh, by transmitter B is received by the re receiver B. So both are kept at angle theta. One is at theta, another is at 180 minus theta with the horizontal. Uh, distance between the transmitter and receiver is L, length L for both the uh, pairs. So as the uh, fluid flows with a velocity V, and uh, the ultrasonic with the velocity C, there is a component of uh, the flow velocity to, to the ultrasonic waves. So for transmitter pair, transmitter receiver pair A, the uh, velocity is in aiding. That is the velocity get added. P cos theta is that in the horizontal direction in the, in the flow. So the, uh, the net velocity, the velocity of the ultrasonic wave is C plus P cos theta. Whereas that for the pair B is C minus V cos theta. Why? Right? Because in the other direction we have the negative. So C minus V. So when you are dividing the velocity by the total distance covered, you will get that is meter per second divided by meter. You will get 1 by S. That is a, a unit for frequency. So when you are dividing velocity with distance covered, you will get the frequency. Frequency of uh, the pair A is c plus v cos theta divided c plus v cos theta divided by l and that for b is c minus v cos theta divided by l so the change can be find out by uh, 
taking the difference and you will get 2 cos theta L. Now we have uh, uh, delta T. Delta T is nothing but L divided by 2 cos theta. Uh, from this we can get an expression for T. This is nothing but L divided by 2 delta T cos theta. The merits of this uh, device, no pressure losses there. It is insensitive to density, temperature or uh, viscosity variations as we can see, uh, as we have seen in electromagnetic flow meters. Good diagnosis is there, response is very fast, uh, high frequency range. It is also a bidirectional device. It can be used for any pipe sizes. And the demerits are its high cost and uh, must be with some uh, reasonable acoustic conductivity. Otherwise, the uh, uh, ultrasonic wave will not pass. And one point I want to add is that uh, for transmitter and crystal, we use piezoelectric crystals. So piezoelectric crystals are for used as the transmitters of uh, receivers of ultrasonic waves. And the final one is a square anemometer. It is a small uh, wire, uh, metal wire with some resistance. It is platinum tungsten or platinum constant. Quarter tungsten is used. Uh, it, it is having a length of uh, almost two to uh, five millimeter. So resistance is also in that range to five ohms. And area of cross section is uh, my. In, in, um, diameter is in micrometers. Micro. Now, uh, this thin wire is heated by passing a, a, a current. As, since the wire is very thin, a small amount of current is required uh, to heat it to a high temperature. Then this heated wire is exposed to flow. Then this flow will take uh, some of the temperature generated to conduction. There are two different operating modes. One is a, a constant current thermometer, the current is kept constant and the uh, temperature change is observed and this temperature change can uh, find a relation with the flow rate. That is the constant current thermometer. The current is kept constant. Temperature difference is measured. The second one is constant temperature thermometer, where the temperature is kept constant and addition, if the flow velocity is high, uh, there is a tendency to the temperature. This temperature drop is compensated by uh, adding some more current, uh, boosting the current. So this uh, change in current is sensed and is uh, uh, finds a relation with the flow rate. In most of the applications, we use constant current anemometer. Why? Because if you are using constant temperature anemometer, and if suddenly the flow, uh, flow stops. So uh, the temperature of the uh, thin wire exceeds and it may burn out. So in most of the cases, we use constant current anemometer. In some uh, other cases, instead of using this hot wire, we use some hot film of metal. So that is, a, uh, that is one of the modifications of hot uh, wire anemometer. You can pose your questions now. And one more clarification I, I want to uh, give for the student who asked about the rotary, a vertically mounted meter. If your pipe is horizontal, you cannot uh, uh, introduce this rotameter. So what you have to do is you can you, you have to put some vertical section and you have to incorporate uh, this rotameter. That is one of the difficulty of using rotameter in some situations. But uh, we are using rotameters in along with some other meters. So with this, we are, I'm winding up the session for today. Uh, you can pause your okay, questions. Uh, Thank you. Sir, uh, we have a question from Akshara again. Uh, where is a uh, hot wire anemometer used? Hot wire anemometer is also can be used for situations uh, where it, it is mostly used for uh, uh, gases. So it is um, mostly used for gases and you can use it for uh, non-conductive fluids also. Uh, that is the application of uh, hot wire anemometer. 
okay uh, sir uh, so we have uh, uh, reached our time uh, thank you so much uh, for the informative session uh, i hope it was uh, really interesting for the st uh, students as well and uh, we are looking forward uh, for your uh, further classes thank you sir thank you for the time thank okay. you thank you so much for the sir team uh, government of kerala and uh, many many of my friends my uh, uh, teachers uh, helped me in uh, conducting this session so i i find uh, this as a great opportunity so thank you so much for this thank you thank you sir thank you have a good day